Good morning, all. You know, it, it, I love the, the noise in the room. It's just wonderful. I'm Bob Fuchs. I'm the pastor here at Down River Church, and we are in worship. The sun is shining. It is a glorious day, and we will be praising God together. We're going to go live on uh, Facebook in just about two minutes, a minute and a half, actually, and we will be sharing the Word of God with them as well, those who are worshiping at home and elsewhere. Praise be God. Good morning again to those of you in the room and for those of you worshiping at home. Uh, welcome to Down River Church. I am Pastor Bob and uh, we are worshiping in person here at 14400 Beach Daily and also streaming live on Facebook. We'll be posting that on YouTube later on so there's many different ways you can worship. And just remember in all of that is going on in the world that we love you and we are glad that you're here as we worship together. Now, we are a church that seeks to grow with God, to serve our community, and to invite others into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we do that in a lot of different ways. I've got my props over here that I pull out every week. Uh, if you haven't connected yet and aren't receiving emails from the church, whether you're worshiping at home or here in person, you can grab one of these Connect cards or do it right online. Fill out the information, add your email address, and we'll be able to share uh, different information about the church, what's going on, as well as prayer requests. And speaking of prayer requests, we are a praying community. And if you flip over that Connect card, if you're here in the room, there's a place to submit your prayer requests. And we know that prayers work, and we also know that they're needed, uh, especially these days as the world is in turmoil right now. And you can leave your prayer requests online as well. You can go right to our prayer room at our website. You can even email the church office. So there's many different ways to get those prayers to this community. And we are a giving community. Uh, if you're in the room, we uh, have envelopes in the back uh, so you can share your financial gifts. If you're worshiping at home or you decide you want to do it electronically, you can do it right at our website. And also you can set up recurring giving. So that happens on a regular basis, and that way you don't have to remember to write those checks. So if you either uh, want to put it in the envelope, you can mail it to the church, but you can put it in the basket in the back along with your Connect card and those prayer requests. Now, Impact Kids is uh, back. We uh, are taking the opportunity to continue to bring the love of Christ to young people, and Miss Lindsay leads them in song and prayer. They see videos. They hear scripture, they listen to stories, and they get a chance to pray as well. They submit prayer requests, and if you want to smile, you should read those prayer requests because they are truly remarkable what our young people pray for. But 10.30 every Sunday. Now, um, Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. Imagine that, Ash Wednesday is on Wednesday. It's March 2nd, 2022. We actually have two opportunities to uh, connect to Ash Wednesday. We're going to be offering drive-through ashes. That you might have heard ashes to go is another term. And we'll be sharing those. 
We actually have tattoos that uh, they're temporary. These are not permanent tattoos, but uh, you know, can, you can wear those or we will be uh, putting ashes as well. And we will worship at seven o'clock here at the church and online on Ash Wednesday, March 2nd. And during Lent, uh, which uh, officially starts at that point, um, we're going to be using uh, Adam Hamilton's uh, book, uh, John, the Gospel of Light and Life. We'll be following this and reading through the entire Gospel of John during Lent. I won't be reading all of those chapters here, but you will have the opportunity to read them as you go through this book. If you haven't picked up a book, they're in the back on the table. And if you're worshiping at home, email the church office at office at drumc.org and we will get you a copy of this. Or, it's incredible, you can buy it online as well or get an ebook. Imagine that. In this day and age, you can buy things online. I was shocked to find this out. <laughs> now, as we uh, continue in worship, uh, we're going to be going to song in just a moment. But uh, Janine is going to, uh, Janine Walker is going to be uh, leading us in our responsive uh, call to worship. And then uh, Janine will be sharing the scripture from Luke. And uh, you're about to hear uh, a song uh, with Tim Robbins, Colleen Mady, Bill Curtis, and Gail Bricky. And uh, please stand as you're able and, and join in singing. And if you're worshiping at home, do the same. No one's there to see. They won't know that you're singing loud and off key like I do. And take part in this wonderful song, I Walk by Faith. Good. 
Get you in the spirit this morning, doesn't it? Right. Our responsive call to worship is from the Abington Women's Preaching Annual. We come together today in awe and wonder before the God we worship. We also come burdened down with worries of the world and the struggles of our individual lives. But in the midst of the worries and the struggles is God, our radiant source of love and hope. We worship together in awe and wonder, worship God who transforms our lives. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36 from the Common English Bible. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. As they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless and at the time told no one what they had seen. Thank you, Janine. A few years ago, actually many years ago now, I always say a few years ago. When our kids were teenagers, we went and we visited the Grand Canyon. I don't know if anyone's ever taken that trip, but there are a lot of people who visit this gigantic hole in the ground. That's what it is. Now, Sue and I decided, because you know we try to do things that are memorable, and we decided we're going to find a spot where we can watch the sunrise and the sunset. And, and so we checked and we were able to find a spot. Now, we had to leave really, really early. Oh, dark 30, anyone familiar with that time? Because in order to get there, there was no parking, so you had to take one of the shuttles. And so you had to get up very early. And I, I do not remember the name of the lookout. By the way, this is not a picture of it. I found this online because I wasn't going to search through all my photos from all the years ago. But I'll tell you, we had a few things going on that made it difficult. Number one, it was very cold and it wasn't supposed to be, so we hadn't packed the right clothes. Secondly, our two children weren't as excited about this opportunity as Sue and I were. And so they asked, if you and mom go do that, would it be okay if, like, we stayed in bed? And because we're amazing parents, we said sure. 
go ahead, you can stay in bed. So we got there well before dawn, we made it, and it wasn't just cold, it was freezing. And we had all the clothes we had brought on our, and it still didn't help. And when we got there to make matters even more upsetting, everything was gray and brown, and it was just boring. And, and we started questioning if we had made the right decision. Would it have been better to stay back with the, the kids and stay in our nice, warm, comfortable bed rather than be out there in the cold? Well, time passed and the sun came up. And the change was incredible. I mean, literally, the Grand Canyon, when the sun comes up, it just pops with color. And it is incredible. And that's why I wanted you to get a, a, it. This, this picture doesn't do it justice when you see it in person. So it was worth getting up early. It was worth braving the cold. And here's the thing about the Grand Canyon, whether it's bathed in sunlight, whether it's overcast, whether it's night, it stole the Grand Canyon, people. It doesn't go anywhere. It's still there. It's the Grand Canyon all the time. But I will tell you, it looks totally different when the light shines on it. And that's what we're talking a little bit about today. This is Transfiguration Sunday. That's what we call what happened up on that mountaintop uh, that you heard Janine read for us. This is the last Sunday before we head into Ash Wednesday and into Lent. Now, transfiguration is one of those words that we don't use all that often. It's not something we use in everyday conversation. I know I don't. But as I speak about transformation and transfiguration, I invite you to pick up your program. If you're worshiping at home, you can do the same because there's a sermon note sheet at the back. And I actually ask you to write down what do you think transformation, transfiguration means. I'm about to tell you, but there's an opportunity to write it down as well. Now, believe it or not, this is one of the words that was first used for this exact reading you heard today. It was a word that hadn't been used before. This is the first time this happened in English. And so according to Webster's Dictionary, I'm going to read you what transfiguration means a complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful or spiritual state. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? And when you look at the verb transfigure, because I want to add this as well, it's to transform outwardly and usually for the better. And that's what happened when the sun hit the wall in the Grand Canyon. That's, it, was, it was transfigured. It was transformed. Its appearance was changed. It met those definitions. It was truly remarkable. Because transfiguration is about change. And if you've been following the sermon series that we just got done with, and you're living in this world today, change is something that happens all the time. And we've been talking about it a lot. See. It's the way of the world, isn't it? Change happens around us constantly. We can't get away from it. For good and for bad, change happens. It happens in the air we breathe, the water we drink, all that we do, the food we eat, constantly going through changes. If we turn around, something is different. And it happens constantly. Now, you can dislike, you can even hate change. You can deny it and ignore it, or you can embrace it. And guess what? Doesn't matter. Change is still going to happen. And it happens constantly, and it happens to all of us, whether you realize it or not. See, we're constantly shedding the old self and putting on a new self, and I, and I mean that spiritually, but also literally. Because I didn't know this, but I found out that we sh shed our cells in our body at an incredible rate. How many cells do you think we go through in a given day? A million. A billion. A billion. I, I heard wrong. Anyone else? You can look this up. I always advise people to do that. 330 
billion cells a day. You gotta remember, cells are tiny, right? But that's how many we go through. So just so you didn't, I, I broke it down, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. That is 230 million cells every minute. I was, I was thinking I could just stand here and watch my watch. And then I would look at y'all and go, see, you're different now. <laughs> We're constantly changing. It's happening to us and we don't even know. You just wait a minute and you will be changing. So as we talk about transfiguration, like I said, we don't use it in normal language much, but it does creep into our culture. And if, if you are not familiar with the Harry Potter books or the movies, this is a, a slide and it's transfiguration class. It's one of the spell classes they have. And just, I always like to give credit where credit is due at Hogwarts school. It was taught by Minerva McGonagall. Remember her? I love her character. She's amazing. She's, she's very direct and strict. And she does it right. And so what she does is she teaches us there's scenes where they turn animals into inanimate objects. And this is inviting, a, a, I believe it's a rat, a mouse, a mouse to tea. So it turns the mouse into the teacup. And so that's what uh, this is. And, and, and there's other ones where... Uh, Human beings are changed into animals and back, and they're, they're transformed into something different depending on the spell. Now, it, this, this is fictional. We know that. This is someone's writing, and it's wonderful stories. And these transformations do make for good stories. And they're interesting. They add to what we're reading. But they're more transformation and metamorphosis. So they really, if you think back to Webster's Dictionary's definitions, they really don't meet the definition of transfiguration. See, the change isn't more holy, it's not always more beautiful, and it's not always for the better. So, if we look at those words, though, that we could use to describe what was being taught, whether it's transformation, metamorphosis, we could use those words to describe what happened on the mountaintop. We don't have to use transfiguration, but we do because something so much more happened on that mountaintop. It's more than we could ever imagine. It's more than Peter, John, and James could imagine. And here's the difference, right? The difference is that Jesus' glory, the glory of God inside of Jesus is being presented in a different way, one that hadn't been seen before. And it's more than a spell or something temporary. It's more than a transformation or a metamorphosis. It's actually telling us who Jesus really is. Jesus isn't changing into something. Jesus already is that something. That's what we have to remember, that we're describing an extraordinary mystery of God. And it, we needed a new word to do that because ordinary, everyday words aren't going to pull it off. Transfiguration. And that's what this morning's scripture talks about. It starts off, though, telling us that Peter didn't go up alone. He brought three of his disciples with him, Peter, John, and James. They came along. And also, I just want you to know, as you're, as you're in your Bible, you can find this account in the first three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels. And we'll, we'll talk more about those as we get into the <laughs> Gospel of John during Lent. But it's in all three of them. You can find it in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. You can find it in Mark. It's in chapter 9, verses 2 through 10. And then we heard it this morning from Luke. Now, I want to tell you there are some slight differences between the accounts. There usually is, but here's what some of them are. And I want you to know these. Matthew and Mark say it took place six days after Jesus had spoken to the people about his death, his resurrection, and how they must take up their cross and follow him. And yet here we have Luke saying it was eight days. <coughs> And I know, two days, what's the big deal? Well, Luke, theologians believe, was trying to align this event with the resurrection because that took place eight days after a Sabbath, if you think of it that way. They believe that's what he was doing. It's a slight difference, but there are no slight differences when you look at the Gospel of Luke. There's always a reason. And, and here's another thing about Luke that... 
If you read through that gospel, you will see over and over and over that Jesus is praying. And in this gospel, in this event, Luke tells us Jesus went up the mountain to pray. And I love that he also points out that the disciples were sleepy and could hardly stay awake. And if you read further and you get to the time of right before Jesus' death, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, the same thing happens. The disciples that he brings with him, Peter, John, James, they have a difficult time staying awake. It's sort of like about four minutes into the sermon when the temperature goes up in the room. <laughs> I'll wait for you. But that's what happened. They, they could barely stay awake. And so, but Luke loves these connections. He takes events that we sort of just read through and he makes a connection between them that we, he wants us to notice that this is going on. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this as, except for the praying part, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Like lightning. See, Jesus was transfigured. His glory was being revealed. Now, we also hear, and this is true in all three of the Gospels, that Jesus was joined by Moses and Elijah. Now, we know that for the Jewish people, Moses and Elijah represented the law, that's Moses, and the prophets. Elijah was the great prophet. And that's what they recognized that. Now, here's what I wonder, though. How did Peter, John, and James know that it was Moses and Elijah? Did they have name tags? It wasn't like they had pictures that they could compare to. Oh yeah, that, oh, yeah, that's him. Could you lower your mask, sir? Yeah, that's you. They didn't have, or maybe, I, I look at it, maybe Moses, because you see this, Moses was holding the Ten Commandments as he was standing there talking, and Elijah was, was dressed like a prophet, whatever that would be. And so maybe that's how they did it. But it says they were clothed with heavenly splendor. You ever feel like that when you're sitting outside and that sun's shining down on you and you're warm, and you feel like you're clothed with heavenly splendor? And, you know, we, we believe that it means they were glowing or they were lit up. And it's because they were in the presence of Jesus Christ. God was radiating out, out of Jesus. And they were glowing. Now, for Moses, this wasn't the first time he experienced this. When we read in the Old Testament in Exodus, you find that Moses, when he went up the mountain and spoke with God, when he came back down, he continued to radiate that experience. His, his skin, his, his face continued to glow. And if you turn to Exodus 34, chapter 34, verse 29, you can find that when he came down, he actually ended up wearing a veil so that people wouldn't see that glowing all the time. You see, what's different, not this time, but for Moses, Moses' change came from God. What's different is Jesus' change came from Jesus. Came from inside Jesus as, as God. And so I look at it and I, I'm thinking, Jesus, thank you so much for including James and John and Peter in this event because that's how we know about it. And it's a good thing they stayed awake or they might have missed it. Part of finding things and seeing things happen is being present and staying awake. Up on the screen, I, 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 when I looked at different paintings, this one is uh, The Transfiguration. That's the title of it. It's by uh, the uh, Italian High Renaissance artist Raphael. Not one of the Teenage, Min teen teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but Raphael the, the painter. Okay, got it? All right. But you can see it has Jesus glowing with him. You see Moses and Elijah. I believe Moses is there on the left because he's got the... Uh, the tablets in there in his hands or maybe he's on the right I don't know which one is which I didn't I didn't go that far to find out but he worked on this until his death in 1620 so this is an old painting now this is only half of the painting the lower half of the painting includes what a depiction of what happens after today's scripture reading after they came back uh, down the mountain 
when Jesus healed a boy possessed by a demon. So Raphael painted this, these two scenes together in one depiction, and you can find it online, and it is beautiful to see, and you can look at all the different nuances that go on. Now, when we look at the scripture, though, based on Peter's reaction and what he said, I think Peter figured out something special is happening here. Peter figured that out. God's glory was shining out of Jesus. It was pouring out. But I get the feeling that Peter really didn't understand what he was seeing yet, even though he saw it, because he wanted it to stay that way. He wanted it to keep happening. So he does, as Peter does, and as we probably would have reacted, says, Jesus, this is really cool, but I want to hold on. We want to hold on to this glory. We want to be able to come worship you here on this mountain. Because that's the way it was for the Israel, Israelites. That's where they first worshiped God, was on the mountain, right? If you go back to Exodus and you can find that story. And so Peter's going back to their heritage wanting to stay up on that mountain. He wants to stay right there so that others can see this as well. And what happens here, though, is Jesus, Peter has now put Jesus, Moses, and Elijah pretty much on the same level, right? We're going to make three shrines, and we will worship you here on this mountain. Because after all, right, shrines last forever. That's what we should build. And we want to believe that. We want to believe they do. But if, if we wonder whether or not they do, all you have to do is listen to the news. Because this last week it was reported that in Amman, Jordan, a team of archaeologists said they found a 9,000, about 9,000 year old shrine in a remote Neolithic site in Jordan's eastern desert. They were on a dig and they found it. Now, it was mostly intact. That's what the article said. It was mostly intact. But here's the thing, over the centuries, it was buried by the sands of time. They had to dig it up to see it. God isn't like that. God remains. God doesn't change. Our shrines that we build, they come and go. Change happens all around us, but what doesn't change is when we are changed by the living God. That's what's amazing in our lives. That doesn't change. The power of the Holy Spirit comes into us and we able, we're able to live in a different way and be different people. And this past few days over at Plymouth First United Methodist Church, a group of 17 men and uh, different leaders and helpers and those guiding them, praying for them, they've been taking part in a spiritual journey. That's what's been going on. And uh, I love the fact that uh, the song Walk by Faith opened up us in worship this morning because from Thursday evening until this afternoon, Sunday afternoon, they are on a walk to Emmaus. Now, it's not a real walk. Okay, you're not going out and roaming the neighborhood. You're not doing that. It's, it's, a, it's a spiritual walk. It's one that takes place at a church or in another location. Now, the reason it's called a walk to Emmaus, I want to make sure that we're clear, is it's named after the encounter that two disciples had shortly after Jesus' death and resurrection. They were traveling back from Jerusalem where they had gone for the Passover and they were returning to their home in Emmaus. And as they were walking along, they were, they were talking about what had happened and that they were confused as to how could Jesus have been killed, but now they're hearing stories that he's been resurrected, that his body is gone. And as they're walking, suddenly Jesus joins them and is walking with them. And Jesus asks them, what's wrong? Why are you so upset? And they explain it to him. And are you the only person who doesn't know what happened? And as they explain it, Jesus goes, well, wait a minute. The scripture tells you everything you need to know. And Jesus proceeds to explain to them why these things had to happen and how scripture was fulfilled. And you can find this in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. And here's what happened. As, as they get to their town and they get home, they, they invite Jesus to share a meal with them. But here's the thing. They don't know it's Jesus. Through all of this, their eyes have been blinded to who Jesus is. They can still see, but they can't see Jesus for who Jesus is. And they invite him to dinner. And Jesus says, sure, I'll share a meal with you. And he sits down. 
breaks bread, and then we hear these words from Luke chapter 24, verses 31 through 32. Their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and he explained the scriptures for us? See, they were changed. They were changed because of what Jesus taught them. Their hearts were on fire for Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of change that can happen to us if we take part in a walk to Emmaus or at other points in our life. And I want you to know, there are separate walk weekends that happen for, for men and women. It's usually twice a year. There are also youth. Uh, they're not called walks. They're actually called chrysalis flights as the caterpillar becomes the butterfly. So youth are able to experience that. Now, several people in our worshiping community, and including myself, have taken part in a walk. And if you ever have the opportunity to do that, I, I, I offer that to you. And here's why, because like the three disciples when they were up on the mountain and they see Jesus transformed, transfigured into something uh, who he really is, but they're seeing him in a new way. That's what can happen during worship. That's what can happen on a walk to Emmaus when you, when you are deeper into that spiritual journey. It can happen during Lent as we do our Lenten disciplines, which we'll talk about this week coming up. We'll have that opportunity to do that. Because see, what happens is our lives are changed when we are open to who Jesus Christ really is. When our eyes are opened, our hearts are open, our minds are open, we are changed through scripture, through prayer, through worship, through music, through connecting with others, through serving others. There's so many different ways that our eyes can be open to Christ. And together we can find hope for ourselves and hope for this world through Jesus Christ. See, when we encounter Jesus Christ, just as the disciples did up on that mountaintop, it can't help but change us. And see, Peter, James, and John, it's what's interesting as we think about this, they had been spending time with Jesus. This wasn't like their first time. They had been with him. He had, he had, they had been traveling with him. They are spending time with him. They are being taught by him. And yet, I don't really think they got who Jesus was. Yeah, he told them, but they didn't really buy it. I, I, I think that's true because until they saw him transfigured and changed, they still didn't get it. Peter still said, let's build shrines. Still not getting who Jesus was. They saw Jesus in glory at that moment. And yet, if that wasn't enough, after Peter says what he says, something amazing happens, and it was read today in Scripture. It's not Jesus who tells Peter what he said doesn't make sense. It's not Jesus. It's God speaking. And in, it, this th is a throwback to Jesus' baptism. You can hear the words of God saying that God is reminding us and, and the disciples who Jesus is because the voice from the cloud that had covered the mountain said this, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. It doesn't say worship him on this mountain. It says, listen to him. See, and what happened on that mountain is not that different than the change when something becomes something different. It's revealing what it really is. Jesus became who Jesus was on that mountain, and yet Jesus didn't change at all. Jesus is who Jesus is. And notice I don't say Jesus is who Jesus was. Jesus is who Jesus is. He was that way when he went up the mountain. He was that way when transfiguration took place. And he was that way when he came down the mountain. He was God incarnate here on earth. And that's, that's the reality of Christ. That we only see a dimension of Christ. We see pieces of Christ at different times. That's what happens to us. But yet, just like Peter, James, and John... We now know who Jesus is. We have the Gospels to tell us the story. We can hear about it. We know what Jesus called us to do in this world, don't we? The teachings are there. We don't have to go far. But yet, many of us, we want to hold tight to Jesus. We want Jesus on Sunday morning. We want to worship Jesus. 
But are we ready and willing to say, yes, this is who Jesus is. I understand and I listen to Jesus' teachings and I'm ready to live a life following Christ, not just in church, but out in the world. See, the transfiguration offers us a glimpse into what's possible for humankind, not just for Jesus showing us the light, but it shows us what humankind can do and what is possible. And yet, this is the part that you have to question what happened. At the end of today's reading, you heard the disciples didn't share this with anybody else. They kept it to themselves. They saw Christ in glory. They saw Moses and Elijah, but we know eventually they told because it's written down. But they didn't tell anyone at that time. And and, and I, I sometimes wonder why they held back. Why did they not do it? Because it said, God told them to listen to Jesus. And this is a Jesus who came and lived among us, lived with us, lived as us. God was here on earth. God incarnate shared this human existence with us. And because Jesus shared a human existence, death would come. And when we look at what we hear in the gospel this morning it says he's talking with Moses and Elijah and this is the only time we hear their conversation or at least notes from it but it talks about Jesus departing in Jerusalem Jesus's execution that would happen is departing of this human life now Jesus could have taken Peter up on his offer right they could have stayed there on the mountaintop Jesus could have been worshiped there and yet Jesus didn't Jesus came back down the mountain and headed to Jerusalem where his death would occur. And when he came back down, we heard in the scripture that he was no longer radiating that glory. There was no physical indication to the world that Jesus was something more. Jesus lived a human life. People couldn't just look at him and go, yep, that's God, I can see the glow. And Jesus just came back down and and continued to teach and continued to move towards Jerusalem. And as we enter Lent, we're going to have the opportunity to see Jesus' glory, to spend time listening to Jesus, to learning, to follow his teachings, to tell others about the gift of God being present in this world, the grace and salvation that each of us receive. We get to share the love of Christ with others. We get to shine, people. And it doesn't only happen up on mountaintops or when the light's shining on us. And it doesn't have to be big. It can be something small. It could be a moment in time. That's what happens when we let the light in, but we don't keep it in, when we share it with others, when we radiate what Christ has shown us. So this week, This week, as we enter the season of Lent, as we experience Ash Wednesday, here's what I invite you to do. Follow Jesus' example. Go to God in prayer. Turn to God in prayer. Think about those times where you experienced God, where you experienced God in a way that was a little different, a little memorable. It could be something big, it could be something small. It doesn't have to be anything that would be overly surprising when you first looked at it but it's something where you saw something transfigured, something more beautiful, something more holy, something more spiritual. Think of it that way. We call those God moments, if you've never heard that term. These are called God moments when you notice that. And what I invite you to do after you've thought of that and you've captured one of those, and you could have many, but share at least one with at least one other person. Let them know about that God moment. Let them know about the glory of Jesus Christ. Because that is what we're called to do, people. We're called to let them know that Jesus Christ is present in the world today, tomorrow, and always. Please join me in prayer. God of glory, we come before you this morning There is news, and it's not just news, it's the reality of of what is going on in this world. War is rearing its ugly head again. 
This morning, we pray for the people of Ukraine as troops are advancing on them, as bombs are falling, as, as battles are being waged. Be with them. Give them hope. Be with their leaders. Be with all of those who are scared, who are, who are questioning what is going to happen next. And God, we also pray for the people of Russia. We pray for their leaders that their eyes may be opened and they may see a new way. We pray for those who are on the front lines who are firing the rockets because we wonder if they truly know what they are doing. Be in their hearts so that they can see another way. Help them to stand strong and to say no. We pray for all of Europe and as they are facing this reality. We here in this country, we're worried whether or not the drive through line is going to go fast enough. Or if things will get shipped to our home in a timely manner. We have no idea. God, we pray for all of the countries because they aren't just countries, they are people. They are your loving children, your creation. War is not what you desire for us. And yet we don't learn from our past mistakes. And God, this morning we pray for the peacemakers, for those who are trying to find a way through conflict into a different reality, one filled with love and hope and peace. We pray for them this morning. And we pray for all of those in this world who are sick and experiencing medical concerns as, as we are continuing to live in a virus and a pandemic we are seeing signs of hope. We give you thanks for that, but we pray for those who are struggling because they have other medical conditions that they haven't attended to. May that opportunity come to them now. God, we, we pray for the strong, we pray for the weak. We pray for those who you hold dearly. You said the meek will inherit the earth. God, we turn to you that that be true. We pray for those who are ignored by society, those who are discounted. We pray for the weary, those who are just looking for a sense of calm. Strengthen them, show them your love. We pray for those who are grieving. Death is all around us. It is part of life, and yet we continue to hurt. We also pray for those whose lives have been changed by knowing Christ, who are now living out a life reflecting Jesus' teachings and what we are called to do. And we pray for the hopeful those who do not give up, those who continue to see a better future in this world, thanks to you and the gift of your Son. We pray for those who are bold and who go out and speak the gospel to others, to let them know that there is something more. We pray, we pray and give thanks for those who hearts, whose hearts are on fire, as they hear your word. Transfigured Christ, we raise our prayers that we have in our hearts, in our minds. We turn them over to you in this time of silent prayer and reflection.
Lord, hear our prayers. And hear the prayer that we say now together, the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we turn to God in song, I invite you to stand if you're in the room or worshiping at home. And the song you're about to hear is Uh, based on Mary's reaction when she came into the garden the morning of Jesus' resurrection, that first Easter. Please join in singing in the garden. I come to the garden alone Go now and tell others we have seen of God's glory. Don't cling to the holy moments when God is revealed to us. Listen to Christ and follow him from the places of revelation to the places of service. God's light of glory shines in our hearts. Christ is with us and will never leave us. And the Spirit renews the image of God within us. Go in peace to love and serve in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.